in April 2021, a number of Facebook ads were spotted which advertised something that many people have been waiting for, a Windows client for the Clubhouse app. Now, Clubhouse is a social network built around voice. The app consists of virtual rooms just full of people talking and you can drop in and out of these rooms and be a fly on the audio wall. It's become very popular. It's not a concept that I thought would ever take off, I'll be honest, but recently it surpassed 8 million downloads with big celebs actively using the platform as well. The likes of Elon Musk and Tim Dillon and Lex Friedman all have made an appearance the thing about clubhouse is it started as iphone only literally only in the last few weeks was an android version actually released and it's an invite only platform as well and the app has seen amazing growth and success because of fomo or fear of missing out if you had to go away and google that like i did it's almost like they've been drip feeding the app to the general user base and that weirdly makes it a little bit more attractive to have and if you weren't on iphone then you'd have even more fomo and forget if you were a mac or a windows user you were literally back of the line so when a series of ads on facebook launched which offered a windows version of the clubhouse app you can imagine all of the windows fomoers thought they'd really hit the big time imagine getting your hands on this app before your friends on their shiny android phones or being able to sit at work on your windows laptop listening into your favorite influencers chat about whatever whilst you pretend to listen to your boss on a zoom call for example the thing is though these facebook ads were not legitimate if you click the ad they would take you to a fake clubhouse website and the windows app you wanted so bad well unfortunately that was malware and so today i'm going to take you through my analysis of this malicious attack looking at both the open source intelligence data of the fake website and also a deep dive into the malware identify what it is how it works and also what it looks like on a victim's machine also, I'm going to talk about this particular product that I use to protect myself from this kind of malware attack. But before we get into that, let's just take a look at the ad again. It looks like a real Clubhouse ad. There is one subtle difference, though. Clicking on this one will take you to joinclubhouse-pc.com instead of the real joinclubhouse.com. If you run a Whois search on that domain, it shows some registration details, and these are probably fake, but we've got a name, address, phone number, and even an email address to go and pivot off. A quick Google search on Google Google Maps for the registrant address points to this leafy suburb outside of Moscow. As it happens, Street View doesn't go so far as this particular street, but we can get close enough. And a Google search for the registrant details shows links to other websites which have used Facebook ads to link to other similar malware campaigns as well. The fake Clubhouse website resolved to a single IP address hosted in Russia between the 4th and 7th of April. And using Risk IQ, you can run a reverse search using the registration metadata to find other linked domains as well and using the email address in this case i found it was also linked to the registration of clubhouse for pc.com which was actually picked up on twitter in late march by a neelan and a neelan actually found the malware which was hosted on bitbucket in this case along with some other questionable files such as signal.exe telegram installer.exe and my favorite computer fixer installer x86.ra catchy. Also as well, A. Neelan in the spirit of InfoSec sharing uploaded these files to Malshare, which is a great website if you want to share this kind of threat intelligence data. And obviously you can download from Malshare into your lab for the purposes of your own analysis. Also, as a side note, I recently found that you can run EXIF tool to display the metadata for these executable files and it supports a load of other file types as well, which is pretty cool. But let's dive into PE Studio. You can see that from some basic static analysis, we can see that this is a Agent Tesla from the results in Virus Total. We can also see this is compiled using .NET, which is great. It sounds pretty straightforward, right? Well, unfortunately, that's not the case because bad guys don't make it easy for us. In this particular case, the malware is pretty heavily obfuscated. It's quite difficult to read and understand what is going on. There's all of this data here. They don't make our lives easy, these adversaries, and why would they? There are a few basic things though that we can glean from the sample without actually running it so if we go back into PE studio we can look at the strings we can see a long list of base 64 encoded content for example and that's easy to extract and decode we can use something like cyberchef for that operation this shows some keywords associated with credential theft so we've got the virus total stuff we've got the credential theft strings well i'm pretty confident this is indeed agent tesla we can also use unpack.me this is my favorite way of unpacking 
brilliant malware now so much time and energy saved it will run the malware unpack it and you're able to download any of the child processes that it unpacks as well the unpacked binary is a dll a dynamically linked library and again it's compiled in .NET as you would expect and also there's a little bit more readable when you put it into dnspy to look at you can see a function called spite sack which i think appears to be a check word for the word canine in a class called Stankovic, which appears to be loading code into memory and then executing it. That's pretty interesting. Before we go down this rabbit hole though, I've already taken you off at a deep dark tangent already and we're not actually looking at the malware from the ads that we first talked about at the start of this video from TechCrunch. I've managed to spin off into malware that was linked to by some other clubhouse malware serving website and that sometimes happens when you're analyzing malware you go down these rabbit holes and it's easy to forget where you started what the goal is and also how you even ended up where you are and the analysis that you're going to take and the next steps what they should be etc trust me I get into this space all the time get up go and have a drink go and take a walk get some fresh air and often times you'll come back with that idea spark to get your train of thought back on track as well so back to the original ad this leads to a website join clubhouse-pc.com which is no longer available but it was serving malware at the time the TechCrunch article actually says that this is likely ransomware given the sandbox run that a researcher performed on the malware now my knowledge agent tesla definitely isn't ransomware it's an info stealer and a credential stealer so we'll have a look at that the sandbox that they used is vmray and it looks like this has classified the malware as ransomware because of two operations the malware performs firstly it renames user files and secondly it also modifies the content of user files and i agree these are attributes of ransomware but these are the only two markers that this sandbox is showing us so i'm definitely skeptical at this point thankfully though someone also used any.run to analyze the malware from where you can actually download the sample which is what i did and i took a look in my lab using dnspy again it shows us some very familiar properties this looks like a very similar sample to the one that a neelan shared on twitter uh, from malshare which was indeed agent tesla and again we can use unpack.me to unpack the next stage of this malware so we can actually view the dll back into dnspy what i noticed though from the parent executable has a few resources resources generally stuff like icons and all of that kind of good stuff associated with an executable so it looks pretty but here there are some resources that appear to be valid png files but don't display any kind of normal looking image it actually all looks like data and this is likely encrypted data so i set myself the goal of working out how to decrypt this data by hand and herein lies yet another rabbit hole that we can go down there's a ton of ways of approaching this analysis. You can statically analyze code in an isolated way. You can, of course, run the malware and observe its behavior, or you can do a kind of hybrid approach of stepping through the code and stopping it at interesting locations and poke about and learn and understand what the code is doing. And that's exactly what I did. And the line of code I am most interested in in this particular case is this one here. It's got calls to three functions that I really want to understand. X, E, H, well, that obviously spells hex backwards. And if you look at that function, we can actually see that indeed it does just appear to be turning hexadecimal to strings which is pretty straightforward. That's nice. Looking at the CBA function, well, this appears to be a little bit more heavy. It takes a bitmap as an argument to the function and it returns an array of bytes. And the bitmap in question is one of those weird PNG resources. And there's also some other funky stuff going on in the middle here where the code passes the pixels as bytes and returns the A or the transparency and the red, the green and the blue values into an array of bytes. And then it also appears to, whatever reason, trim the first four bytes and then return. Now let's look at the function FGH. And my eyes are immediately drawn to these words XOR. And I'm thinking this is already the decryption routine but you can see that XOR appears numerous times here so I'm a little bit nervous at this point it gets the byte array from the CBA function as an argument it calls itself p1 and also we can see that k1 here is a string and I'm going to hazard a guess that the k stands for key and we can see that that relates to an XOR key as well the line of interest is this one here the bytes in PNG are being iterated over. Each byte is XORed with num and also the integer value of a byte from K1. So not the usual kind of XOR, but num itself is defined as the last byte in the P1 array. And that's XORed with a static value of 112. And that equates to 140 in this case. And then weirdly, the second XOR key I thought was initially cycling through the char code values for the string WC1, which is what is passed to as an argument to this function. But in fact, what the three character string is initialized 
characterized as is a byte array and there are null bytes between the characters. So the three char codes that get iterated over are in fact 0, 119 and 0. I'm pretty sure that was intentional, otherwise it wouldn't really decrypt, but it just seems a little bit weird. Anyway, I plucked all of these functions out from .NET, I converted them into Python, and I built on some of the analysis and research already done by Unit42 Palo Alto. I ran the PNG file through, and it spat a DLL out at the end. At this point, I'll refer you to a tweet of mine recently where I allude to the fact that my Python code seems to work great, but only up to a certain point. So if you want to go down that rabbit hole, please take a look at that Twitter thread and see if you can get involved and solve some of the problems I came across. Okay, but let's just zoom out a little bit. Not, not maybe not quite that far, but what happens when we run this malware? Let's just let it loose on the machine and see what it's capable of. We've gone full on straight into the deep dive here and not really analyzed the malware from a behavioral point of view. And to be honest, sometimes that's actually more interesting. So let's first get some tools ready to monitor the system here. I'm going to use Procmon to monitor all of the activity and also to monitor the network. I'm going to use Microsoft Network Monitor because I really like the fact that it can tell me what process ID is responsible for the particular network conversations. And in Procmon, I can see the malware enumerate in file and folder locations locations associated with credentials and cryptocurrency, presumably to steal the data. You can see the keywords here like key, wallet, doc, text, etc. Also enumerates user data folders from many popular applications, all related to credential and financial theft. Looking at the network activity, we can see the malware communicates with a C2 hosted in Russia, and it appears to use the SOAP protocol to send post requests. And within the body of these SOAP requests, you can see some metadata about my machine being passed to the C2, and also some other interesting stuff too. As a test, I wrote a passwords text file to my desktop and indeed it passed this data and the base 64 encoded contents of this data all back to the C2. The running processes on my machine were sent, my search history in Chrome and a list of installed applications and some other details about my machine were all piped back to the bad guys. And what also grabbed me was this large blob of data here and this is in fact a screenshot of my desktop and that's super sneaky. So they can see and capture stuff that I've got open on my screen maybe my password manager, for example. One of the primary aims of this malware is to profile the victim and steal as much financial data as possible. We've all probably heard about the recent rise and trends in crypto investments, especially since the pandemic, and Bitcoin prices go in all-time highs and lows, and, and other coins such as Dogecoin making a massive play in the market thanks to a certain billionaire. You may have even invested yourself to play in the markets, and why not? There's potentially huge losses, I mean gains, to be made. And with this kind of malware at play, the lengths that the adversaries are going to in order to get people to download and run these applications, I mean, taking advantage of Clubhouse's rise to fame and spotting an opportunity to trick people on Windows into you know, something that's pretty clever, I think in order to steal cryptocurrency, it's a pretty advanced, complex campaign here. And if you get your cryptocurrency stolen, who are you going to ring? How do you get your money back? And that's why I use this. This is a Jupyter wallet made by Fatian. This is an extremely secure way of protecting your crypto wallet and managing your assets. So even if the malware made it into your system and stole your data, the adversary would still need this Jupyter wallet to move your money. And that puts you in control, protects your finances, gives you confidence to trade cryptocurrency online, and you can enjoy 20% off using the discount code Colin-20 at checkout. And they've also got loads of other great products to protect you against phishing and man-in-the-middle attacks. So I encourage you to go and check them out. And I thank Fatian for supporting this channel. Also on that note, if you would like to support this channel, I've recently launched a Patreon. The link is below in the description where I share insights into the interesting stuff I read in the industry and watch online. And you can also get access to my video notes, which show my kind of brain dumps and methods and organizational structure of malware analysis. Thank you for watching, coming along for the ride. I love your questions and comments. Please smash the like button, subscribe as well. It really does mean a lot. Till next time, keep well.